It's time to end tonight's foolish theatrics. Right now, you have no captive audience. Let every worthy sacrifice be carved in ice. With this nation, endure for all time. You know that moment in Pokemon when you get asked to join Team Rocket and you desperately want to say yes because being evil is more fun? No. That's how I feel right now. I enjoyed this teaser a lot. Not only was it gorgeous in terms of scenery and character design, but it was just rich in things we need to dissect. Suffice to say, there's a lot to talk about, and it's time I give my list of Harbinger rankings and constellations. And why don't we throw in some speculations about their roles in the story and also throw in some brain rot <laughs> near the end of the video. Now I'm going to ignore Senora because girl, rest in peace. And I feel like most people know her story though. I low key think we'll hear more about her when we talk about how the Cataclysm affected Mondstadt. Yeah, I know we heard about Devalin's story, which is connected to the Cataclysm, but we haven't heard how the Cataclysm specifically affected Mondstadt and its people in the main story yet. So I'm gonna put a rain check on talking about Senora. We're also gonna skip Child because we pretty much know all we need to know about him for now. But I will say the level of thirst that I have for this man in his winter coat Damn. Are you homosexual? Anyways, without further ado, let's head on over to Clown University and start the show. Beginning with a quick little blurb about the cathedral this teaser is taking place in. <laughs> This place looks a lot like the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, Russia. I mean, look at it. The domes, the arches, everything is crazy similar, which makes sense. Snezhnaya is based on Russia after all. But the interesting thing about this place is it's actually the second church on these grounds. The original one was built in the 1800s and took over 40 years to build, becoming consecrated in 1883. However, the 1917 Russian Revolution led to the officiation of state atheism for the USSR. And that led to an anti-religion campaign that would persist through the 1920s. Religious monuments and institutions were ransacked and destroyed by the government for their gold and other relics of monetary value. And the Cathedral of Christ the Savior was no different. On the 5th of December, 1931, 40 eight years after its construction, the church was blown to smithereens, and a grand building called the Palace of the Soviets would be built in its place. This palace was to be a testament to socialism and the legacy of Vladimir Lenin, which is why a giant statue of him was supposed to be the building's main feature. Ultimately, the palace wasn't built, and the cathedral was rebuilt, becoming consecrated on the 19th of August, 2000. I couldn't help but notice the similarities in the history of this church and to Vought's origin story from before Sun and Moon. You know, like how the war against the Seven Sovereigns took 40 years and then it took 400 years to remake the world. And this story is based on the biblical story of Noah's Ark in which God destroys the world and rebuilds it using the remaining life on the Ark. Noah's Ark is ultimately a story of creation, uncreation, and recreation. Same thing with Tavat's story. And it's the same thing with the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, which was built, destroyed, and then rebuilt. This makes it the perfect place to use for this teaser because the history of this church parallels with the Fatui's plans so well. Piero talks about destroying the old world, seizing it from the gods and rebuilding it into something new, just like what the Soviet Union tried to do with the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. Maybe in the Fatui's new world, there'll be a giant statue of the Tsaritsa, or if their plans follow the Cathedral of Christ the Savior's history, their plans will fail. Perhaps they already did. <laughs> or they'll just make a pool out of the world, because that's apparently what the Russians did with their church before they rebuilt it. I don't know. But as Piero says, checkmate isn't the end of the game. There are probably more rounds to play with the gods, as many as the Fatui need until humanity triumphs. Anyway, I wanted to mention this church because I thought it was a cool reference, and it really shows you the Hoyoverse team is super thoughtful when it comes to symbolism. But anywho, while we're on the subject of the Fatui's plans, why don't we talk about what they have in store for Sumeru?
By now we know Celestia is all about keeping secrets from humanity, right? And the Archons are just as tight-lipped. The Dendro Archon Kusanali should be no different. Wisdom is her enemy because knowledge in this world can be a very dangerous thing. You could draw the ire of the wrong gods and get yourself demolished by the heavenly principles. But what if that's exactly what the Fatui want? Lisa, who was the most talented sorceress the Academia had ever seen in 200 years, said she witnessed uninhibited erudition in Sumeru, raving mad scholars in the forests, and powerful sages sitting underutilized on advisory councils. This implies there may be a lot of scholars who are experimenting with dangerous ideas in their relentless pursuit for knowledge, and with an advisory council that isn't really used or listened to, those scholars might be able to conduct experiments on whatever they want, like, for example, human experimentation or experiments in blasphemy. Dottore says one of his segments is conducting an experiment in blasphemy. Blas Blasphemy is the act of contempt for sacred things or gods. So what if his plan is to push Sumeru towards the precipice? Push the nation to a breaking point that will compromise its very existence, and that is the true push for folly instigated by the Fatui. Maybe the Fatui want another Conria, or at least the threat of Sumeru becoming another Conria, and that's also why Piero says at the beginning of the teaser the Fatui alone know the value in acts of folly, because they know what will happen if you dig a little too deep into the world's secrets and discover the wrong kind of information. Since Sumeru is the nation of life and wisdom, and Conria was destroyed because of whatever knowledge they possessed, and the art of Chemia, a branch of alchemy that creates life, then maybe Sumeru will truly follow in Conria's footsteps. And I think the Fatui might exploit the Akasha system to accomplish their goal. You can watch this video for my take on the system itself, but it's basically just one gigantic repository of knowledge that functions via the Dendro Archon's Gnosis. And my assumption is that anyone with this little earpiece thing can access it. Since the knowledge it contains is managed as a resource, then it's possible only certain members of society have access to certain kinds of knowledge. If that's the case, then I wonder what would happen if someone started leaking forbidden knowledge to people who never should have seen it. What would happen if the wrong people discover the wrong kind of information and do something blasphemous? Puppeteering the scholars of Sumeru, the Fatui are going to orchestrate something so perverse that even Kusanali won't be able to ignore, causing her to reveal herself, and that's when Dottore will have the chance to get the Gnosis. And if you know anything about Dottore, whatever he's planning is going to be super f***ed up. While we're still on the topic of Gnosis, why don't we talk about the Balladeer Scaramumu? I mean, Scaramouche. Scaramouche is MIA with A's Gnosis, which by the way, might be shaped like a knight's chess piece, since on this chessboard, the fallen pawn represents Senora because of the crimson lotus moth on it. The white knight that captures the fallen pawn must then represent the Raiden Shogun because she's the one that terminated Senora. And since Venti and Zhongli's Gnosis are being used as chess pieces on this board, it's highly likely the white knight is meant to represent A's Gnosis. But anyway, Child was sent to look for our little emo death puppet, and he's been at it for a while, ever since the Mystic Onmyo Chamber event to be specific. But it seems like Child isn't the only one who's been on the hunt. Dottore apparently is too. And that's not really surprising to me because Scaramouche was given some upgrades upon joining the Fatui, and they also restored his original powers that were sealed away by A when she decided to let him go after he cried like a little bitch baby right after being born. I mean, who does that? Dottore likely oversaw Scaramouche's upgrades since he's got a penchant for making things stronger and more perfect, and I use that word loosely. I'm sure Dottore's examined the Gnosis the Fatui have acquired as well, so this might be why he's involved too. He's the expert here. As for where Scaramumu is and what he's doing, I think Dottore gave us some clues. Conventional wisdom holds that divine knowledge cannot be rationally comprehended. After conquering the Divine Gaze, he will make his next move. Divine knowledge likely refers to the Gnosis. Gnosis literally means knowledge or awareness in Greek, and the Gnosis of Genshin belong to the Divine, hence Divine Knowledge. If that's the case, then the Divine Gaze likely refers to visions? Visions are called the Eyes of God in the Chinese version, and the phrase the God's Gaze has been used several times in the game in reference to visions, especially in this scene right here. They want your attention, your divine gaze. 
You mean visions? Yeah, so if divine gaze refers to visions, then one possibility is Scaramouche has a vision and he's learning to master its secrets. But I think it's highly likely Scaramouche just discovered some sort of truth about the world via the Gnosis and he's simply trying to understand it or maybe figure out what he's going to do with that information. See, Scaramouche was originally intended to be a vessel for A's Gnosis. It's the heart he always wanted because although he probably won't admit it, he longs to be human. He's truly the Pinocchio of Genshin Impact, a very moody, homicidal one, which is probably why the constellation of the doll holding a heart is his. But when he finally got his hands on what was supposed to be his heart, he discovered the Gnosis was just like the Morbius movie. Nothing anyone would expect or want, an abject disappointment only worthy of being meme material. As for why the Gnosis isn't all it's cracked up to be, well, that's something we'll talk about in a future video. All I'm going to say is this. It's interesting. The artifact from the Husk of Opulent Dreams set that discusses Scaramouche's impression of the Gnosis is called the Song of Life, and that the Gnosis is specifically called a sacrifice. Fainies. <laughs> Anyway, I think we'll definitely get an update on his whereabouts in Sumeru. Maybe he'll be there to learn more about whatever truth he discovered. But whatever his plan is, though, it can't be good. There is no way Scaramouche is keeping A's Gnosis. The Fatui are gonna get it one way or another, and I have a feeling Dottore is gonna be involved in its retrieval. Honestly, all I want to see is an epic showdown between Scaramouche, the Traveler, and Kazuha. And we need an interaction between A and Scaramouche. Mother and son must confirm front each other, which is why I think the resolution of his story will happen in Inazuma. Oh, and um, I hope Scaramouche becomes playable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're at the fun part of the video. Let's talk about the new Harbingers. Sound good? No. Good. I really like all of their designs, by the way. I can't pick a favorite. Okay, that's kind of a lie. I'm really loving Pantalone, Arlecchino, and Piero. And I love the new mask for Dottore. It's totally on point with the Commedia Dottore's mask, but anyway. Why don't we go down the table starting with Dottore. In the Commedia dell'arte, Dottore is a wealthy, intelligent man who is selfish, greedy, pompous, and obsessed with himself. Depending on how he's portrayed, he may bore others with his intelligence or make no sense at all. Harbinger Dottore stays true to all of the above in several ways. Dottore was once a student at the academia who was shunned by his peers and teachers because of his unorthodox ideas. He was chased out of his hometown for a similar reason. He wanted to create enhanced humans that could surpass the gods, which is a big no-no around the devoutly religious. Eventually, he was approached by Piero who offered him the deal of a lifetime. In exchange for his service to the Fatui, Dottore was allowed to conduct his unorthodox experiments with all the Fatui's resources at his disposal, and of course he accepted, since the academia wasn't letting him really do what he wanted. Ever since joining the Fatui, his scientific accomplishments are but not limited to the following. He created prostheses of himself at different stages of his life that he refers to as segments, created machine-human hybrids from corpses, mass-produced ruin guards in this now-abandoned factory, and he also weaponized Archon Residue by infusing it in people. Kale was one of those test subjects. Archon Residue isn't a phrase that's been used in the game yet, but it's virtually the same thing as Miasma and Tatarigami. It's the lingering power, will, and resentment of a dead god. I imagine we'll hear the term Archon Residue or something equivalent to it in Sumeru since the term was introduced via Sino, someone from Sumeru, but anyway. I want to talk a little bit more about Dottore's segments. We may have seen multiple ones in the Genshin comic, as well as at least two in the Genshin teaser. The one that's in the prime of his life is the one we'll likely encounter in Sumeru. I just keep imagining a scene where the main characters think they've beaten Dottore, only for another version of him to show up and be like, surprise bitch, bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. But him having segments of himself actually gives me hope for one of them becoming playable. It seems like all the playable characters have to be friendly in some way with the Traveler. Maybe they'll change this, but if they don't, Dottore's gonna be a very difficult character to redeem, which is why I think it's completely plausible for one of his segments to possibly go rogue, have a change of heart, or something to that effect. Then again, if they can redeem the likes of A and her troubled son, then I guess anything is possible. He doesn't have to be a saint, because that would be super weird, but I think he will at least have to get along with the Traveler, and that might be possible for one of his segments. There is one other notable thing I wanted to mention about Dottore that I will be very interested in hearing more about. He slayed Ursa the Drake, 
single-handedly. This dragon-plagued Mondstadt for centuries, dating back to Vanessa's time, and he's also the one that murdered Diluc's father, Creepus. So the fact that Datore killed him is pretty impressive. There are a lot of characters connected to Datore now that I really think about it, and it makes me excited for some of the plot lines we are gonna see. I need a confrontation between him and Diluc. It has to happen. Okay. Let's talk about Dottori's constellation. It could be the Plague Doctor Mask or this symbol here. The Plague Doctor Mask is rather on the nose for him. Plague Doctors were public servants as they treated victims of bubonic plagues regardless of their financial status, but while they were supposed to cure patients, they rarely actually did so. Many weren't even experienced in medicine, and some even charged for services that were completely ineffectual or made things worse. Some even tried to sell their patients fake cures. That being said, a lot of Plague Doctors were actually trying to help their patients. While I wouldn't consider Dottori a public servant, he and his subordinates were tricking people into giving away their children under the pretext of curing them of their afflictions. Commedia Dottori was also known to attempt to convince other characters in the play to take one of his cures for ailments characters didn't actually have. That being said, Harbinger Dottori isn't trying to help his test subjects. Yes, I guess you could argue that trying to enhance humans is helping them in a sense, making them more perfect in his eyes, but Dottori has a complete disregard regard for human life, and Plague Doctors weren't exactly like this, at least not all the time. So this Plague Doctor constellation could be a wonderful fit for Dottore, but there is another guy who it could belong to and we'll talk about him later. For now, I'm gonna give Dottore this symbol here. It's a symbol of heresy. Dottore is called a heretic. He even uses an arena called Heresis for testing out some of his experiments, so it seems fitting. Now, as far as Dottori's rank in the Fatui is concerned, the rankings seem to be based on power. Power could mean battle prowess, but could also mean prestige, contributions to the Fatui, and political influence. Dottori seems to have a pretty decent mixture of all these things. Remember that he slayed a dragon, and dragons can possess powers that rival the gods. While it's hard to gauge just how powerful Ursa was compared to Dvalin or Ejdaha, for example, I don't want to ignore the fact that dragons are strong in general, so considering his battle prowess, political influence, and scientific feats, I hereby place him at either rank 2 or 4, and I'm gonna settle on 4 because I actually think the next Harbinger we're gonna talk about is number 2. Loafalta's sacrifice is a great pity. Her loss shall not hinder our progress, but Detore. What of Scaramouche and the Gnosis from Inazuma? Capitano so far hasn't been mentioned much at all outside of a daily commission and Child's voice lines. Child respects him greatly because of his battle prowess, which is interesting because in the Commedia dell'arte, Il Capitano is a braggart who uses bravado to imitate and present the illusion of power. He's all smoke and no fire, just a big talker who fabricates and exaggerates his own accomplishments. And he's a little bitch baby, a coward. The whole point of his character is to be exposed as a fraud. Now, since Child has seen Harbinger Capitano fight well, Capitano might be strong and capable instead of weak and cowardly, but I think there's more to this story. Capitano's face is the only one of all the Harbingers that's fully concealed, or he just doesn't have a face at all, which is very disturbing to think about. And while that is cool, it's really f***ing weird. This could mean a couple of things. One is that he has no mask to demask, and therefore nothing to expose. Or he is hiding something shocking about himself that will eventually be exposed. And I'm more inclined to believe that than the former. Which brings me to his constellation. I'm thinking it's the Hand of Glory. Hands of Glory are the severed and pickled hands of hanged men. Usually the left hand, or if the person was hanged, committed murder, it was the hand that was used to commit said murder. The candle the Hand of Glory holds is made from the fat of the hanged man. People used to believe these hands could open any door and also held Medusa-like powers in that they rendered motionless anyone who was shown them. Capitano might really be a fit for this Hand of Glory for a few reasons. One, this could be a play on the word glory, since Commedia Capitano was based on Spanish caudillos, military or political leaders, specifically the caudillos who boasted about their glory 
days. Also, the phrase hand of glory actually originates from the French expression main de gloire, which does translate to hand of glory, but is actually a corruption of the French word mandragore, which refers to mandrakes. The association between hands of glory and mandrakes comes from an old belief of alchemists that mandrakes grew from the blood or, um, <laughs> semen produced by hanged men under the gallows. Didn't people believe the darndest things? But the thing is, people believed that mandrake roots, which are shaped like the human form, would scream and cry upon being exposed from the ground, killing anyone who heard them. This could fit well with Commedia Capitano's plot function of being a character who is meant to be exposed. Maybe Harbinger Capitano will be like this. He might be hiding something underneath all that armor that might paralyze everyone with shock and fear. He might be a walking corpse for all we know and using someone else's body and talents for himself with the real Capitano somewhere inside that is actually weak and dependent upon the host body. Could even be just an empty suit of armor with a centralized power source. Again, he might not have a face. The corpse or empty armor could be likened to this clawed hand and the real Capitano somewhere inside the body is like the flame the clawed hand is holding. A dead body clinging to a spark of life. And you know what? Hoyoverse just showed us this theory is entirely possible with Kazuha's story quest, in which a sword with its own consciousness was wearing people's bodies like suits of meat and controlling them. But the actual sword itself was weak and derelict after years of use and a lack of maintenance. It was just making itself look badass, wearing a glamour to hide its bedraggled form and clinging to a host body to survive. The story of this sword mirrors Commedia Capitano so well that it's really hard to ignore. Both make themselves appear powerful, but are at their cores frauds, truly weak and utterly helpless. I will not be surprised if Harbinger Capitano's storyline follows a similar pattern. As far as his rank is concerned, from Child's perspective, Child isn't worthy of Capitano's notice due to being ranked too low, so this definitely rules out 10, and 7 is a little too close for me to Child's rank, so it's gotta be 2 or 4. I wouldn't be surprised if he does end up being rank 4, since that's still a high rank, but I'm more inclined to believe he's rank 2 because if Capitano's gonna be exposed as a fraud? Well, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. I feel like positioning him in one of the highest spots possible will make this impact of being exposed a lot stronger. So for now, I give him rank two with the Hand of Glory constellation. <laughs> Merely half a day? People say the Northland Bank's true currencies are blood and tears. But Mayor, even speaking as a banker, that sounds a little unconscionable. Okay, now let's talk about the incredibly sexy Pantalone. Pantalone has been confirmed as the ninth harbinger, and he's also the richest of them despite growing up poor. His lust for money was born of his disdain from not being one of the gods chosen, which most of the theorist community interprets as he doesn't have a vision. Couple that with being poor, and you get a guy who pursues financial gain, not just because it improves his station in life, but also because money in most cases equals power, and therefore he can feel powerful. While he manages the Fatui's financial affairs, one of his main roles is to actually facilitate economic destabilization across Tavad, since his goal is to make Shnejnaya the heart that pumps money around the world. Or in other words, he wants to make all of Tavat financially dependent on Shnejnaya. At least that's my interpretation. One of his agents was sent to destroy Mondstadt's wine industry, and he was also involved with a plot to install a puppet Tianshu in the Liu Qixing. Not to mention Pantalone also runs the Northland Bank in Liyue, he's got quite the foothold in Liyue. He also rented out the entire Grand Goth Hotel in Mondstadt for unknown reasons, but from the sounds of it, whatever the Fatui are doing in there can't be good. I hope we get to learn more about this little plot thread soon. But Harbinger Pantalone actually mirrors his Commedia dell'arte counterpart quite well. Commedia Pantalone represents the rich. He is self-absorbed and loves his money, and often treats his peers poorly and inhumanely, much like Harbinger Pantalone lusts for money and has no qualms about interfering with the economics of neighboring nations for the sake of making Snezhnaya the leader of the world economy. He literally says he's willing to do anything. Now, I actually don't think Pantalone is much of a 
fighter, if one at all. Arlecchino accuses both him and Pulcinella of remaining hidden away in their homelands, which suggests they might not see much field action, especially on the battlefield. Like I said earlier, Pantalone doesn't have a vision, and although he might have a delusion, I want to remind you using delusions is extremely taxing on the user and potentially fatal, especially for normal people, so I seriously doubt he's the combative type. That would make a lot of sense because Commedia Pantalone also represents the elderly. The character always walks with a hunched back, and his movements are considerably restricted because of his old age. Harbinger Pantalone obviously isn't that old, but he might be like an old person in that he doesn't take much physical action personally. He's probably more of a behind the scenes type of guy, and I don't know if he's gonna be playable because of that. That being said, Hoyoverse could always surprise us. There is a likelihood he's connected to Dottore. You can see Pantalone wearing a ring that looks suspiciously like this constellation, which is the symbol for heresy, but his constellation might be this one. Hands are symbols of power and protection, and also generosity, hospitality, and stability. Money can provide all of these things. Hands are also used for handling and exchanging money, and I low-key believe we got a close-up of his hands solely as a hint for this constellation being his. As for why he would have a ring that looks a lot like this symbol, this ring reminds me of the kind you would get if you're a part of a secret society or club. Remember Harris's, the underground Fatui arena Dottore uses. Notice all the spectators. Krupp, Dottore's underling, alluded to the fact that at least some of the children abducted by the Fatui are being used here for the sick game rich people play. Perhaps the wealthy people from Snezhnaya or elsewhere come to watch these children die. Maybe they even bet on these kids like racehorses, and maybe the members of this secret little club get rings that look like this. Pantalone might be one of Harris' patrons. He's likely the wealthiest man in Snezhnaya, and he and Dottore are similar in some ways. Pantalone has an aversion to the gods and the control they exercise over most facets of life. He has pursued worldly power because of that. Much like Dottore has often argued for the obsolescence of gods and pursued scientific power. So I could see them easily being friends, especially since their Commedia dell'arte counterparts are often friends, mentors, and foils of each other. At the very least, they might respect each other. Maybe Pantalone runs and funds Harris's, and Dottore merely provides the entertainment. Who knows? But behind this serene smile may lie a cold and ruthless person. Moving on down the table, we've got the gender-bent Sandrone, and the first thing that immediately drew my attention was the extremely dapper and well-dressed ruin guard holding her. Sandrone regularly conducts research on automatons, the majority of which are ruin machines, which is why it looks like she repurposed one for herself. In fact, I would go as far as saying she's obsessed with them and also sympathetic towards them. Commedia Sandrone is seen as a spokesperson for the ill-treated, exploited, and misunderstood. He represents the peasantry. If you really think about it, ruin guards fit this description because most people in Tavat are afraid of them, don't really understand them, and they hail from Conria, which was unjustly destroyed at least from the perspective of Conrians. Not to mention Conrians have been likened to farmers, which are peasants, at least historically, through their use of field tillers, otherwise known as ruin guards. Tillers are farm equipment. Conrians are like the peasants who were cruelly suppressed and exploited by the upper class, who in this case, are the gods. It's possible that at some point in Sandrone's past, she grew fond of ruin guards and empathized with their plight. Maybe it started as an intellectual curiosity that turned into pity. I don't know, but there's no denying she likes them, especially since she detests Child, who coincidentally destroyed a bunch of ruin guards in Dottore's abandoned factory, and probably suspects that's the reason she loathes him. Sandrone might even go as far as treating ruin guards like her family, and I'm thinking thinking she's got a second ruin guard somewhere. Commedia Sandrone has a wife and son, so it's possible Harbinger Sandrone made a husband and child ruin guard. But I actually think she might be the child. Arlecchino says we don't want to make the children cry when getting Pulcinella and Pantalone to shut up, implying there are children in the room and Columbina and Sandrone are the only ones who look like children.
children, or at least teenagers or young adults. So maybe Sandrone made a mother or father for herself, I don't know. She also might not be entirely human, but who knows. Either way, there's a third robot probably lurking somewhere, and I think the stylized Triquetra present on Sandrone and the Ruin Guard reinforces this idea. Normally, I would be screaming about the moon at the side of this symbol, but I'll actually be doing that later when we talk about a different Harbinger. I actually think this symbol in this context merely represents a trinity between Sandrone, her dapper bodyguard, and the unknown third robot or person that she might have. I don't know. Now, as far as her constellation is concerned, it's obviously the puppet on strings. Her code name is the marionette. Commedia Sandrone was originally represented as a puppet. If I had to guess, her rank is probably either seven or 10. And honestly, I'm leaning towards 10 because she looks the least threatening of the Harbingers, in my opinion. But looks can be deceiving, so we'll see. But you heartless businessmen and dignitaries always with a convenient excuse to remain in the comfort of your homeland. You couldn't hope to understand. So why don't you keep your mouths shut? We don't want to make the children cry. All right, next up is Arlequino. She has to be one of my favorite new Harbingers. Like, look at her eyes, they are insane. Her character design is just mwah, and I can't wait to see what her normal outfit's gonna look like. Anyway, Arlequino runs an orphanage in Snezhnaya called the House of the Hearth. Now, most of these orphans were made into orphans due to the direct actions of the Fatui, so I don't know if Arlequino genuinely wants to help these kids or if she's just making more future soldiers out of them, since at least some of her underlings were raised in her orphanage. On that note, I think she's a lot older than she looks, because the Fatui agents who were raised in the House of the Hearth are definitely adults. She may have not always been the head of the orphanage, but... I just wanted to point that out. Child basically calls her insane, but he might be biased against her because he's very loyal to the Tsaritsa, while it seems like she isn't. She'd betray the Fatui if it benefited her, which means there's a very good chance she's gonna betray the Fatui at some point and is actively plotting against them now. And if she does leave, she'll probably take her children with her. Maybe she wants to stage a coup. I don't know, but I think she may try to drag Columbina along for the ride, too. In the Commedia dell'arte, Arlecchino competes with Piero for the love of Columbina, which results in Columbina breaking Piero's heart. So, Harbinger Arlecchino could recruit Columbina to her side if and when she makes her exit from the Fatui, and maybe that's how they'll break Piero's heart. It'll just be some good old mutiny. For Arlecchino's constellation, my guess would be the nails. In times of antiquity, nails were actually considered symbols of protection that warded off evil, which is one of the reasons why the Romans used them for crucifixions to atone for the bad deeds of those crucified. They are also symbols of unity as they join things together. Nails used in the foundation of houses were also thought to be protective, and it just so happens that Arlecchino runs a facility called the House of the Hearth, in which she protects, provides a home for, and raises orphans, uniting them as a family of sorts. In this sense, nails are a a really good match for her. I do have another reason why nails are perfect for her, but that ties in with the brain rot I talked about <laughs> at the beginning of the video. So that explanation will have to wait for later. As for her rank, my guess is she's number seven. I don't think she's more powerful than Capitano, Dottore, or Scaramouche, and her political power probably isn't as extensive as Pulcinella's. And I also think she's stronger than Sandrone. I don't know, she just gives off that impression, so. I give her rank seven and the Nails Constellation. We are gathered here today to remember our dear comrade. In honor of her sacrifice, all work should halt for half a day as the nation mourns her passing. Now we've arrived at the Monopoly man himself, the fifth Harbinger Polchinella. He's the guy that represented Snezhnaya in the Travail trailer, and that totally makes sense because he's the mayor of Snezhnaya and likely handles most of its domestic affairs. And this also means it's highly unlikely he does any sort of field work, much like Pantalone. He's probably almost always in Snezhnaya. Polchinella is the one who conscripted Child into the Fatui, and he also watches over Child's family. This might make him seem kind-hearted, and in some ways he might be, 
but he does have a cold side to him. He will not hesitate to get rid of less valuable assets for the greater good. And while he appeared to mourn Senora's death, he only allotted half a day in her honor, not even a full day, which was immediately called out as unconscionable. The show must go on, I guess, but damn. It's like he's on a fence, teetering on the line between being a decent person and being outright heartless. Or he just wants to try and please everyone, whether that's because his job demands it or he has some other ulterior motive. This falls very much in line with Commedia Pulcinella. In fact, Harbinger Pulcinella is likely going to be a perfect reflection of his Commedia counterpart. Commedia Pulcinella is a versatile character that can be a servant or master. He is a self-preservationist that tries to gain favor with those beneath him and those above him. Despite his self-interest, he still manages to take care of the affairs of everyone else. Else. He plays both sides to get what he wants, and regardless of the result, Polchinella always emerges on the side of the winners. We have already been shown a character who is exactly like this, Zhu Yi from Yelan's Story Quest. He was a social climber who sought the respect of everyone around him and treated everyone with kindness despite the people of Liyue initially treating him poorly when he was growing up destitute. But at some point he grew bitter with how hard he had to work to achieve his goals and how long it was taking. So he turned to the Fatui to assist him with reaching the position of Tianshu. He resorted to committing horrible acts just to rise to the position of Tianshu, like poisoning the current Tianshu, Uncle Tian, the man he saw as a father figure, and also poisoning and double-crossing Yusupov to ensure Yusupov would take the fall for the entire operation. You could call this getting rid of less valuable assets for the greater good. He played both sides like a fiddle, and even though he was exposed in the end, he was still rewarded in a way. Even though he went to prison, Yelan offered him a deal to protect him from the Fatui he betrayed, while Zhu Yi would still be working as a mole for the Liu Qixing. Y'all, this man is literally the carbon copy of Commedia Pulcinella, and I have a feeling Harbinger Pulcinella will be similar to Zhu Yi in a lot of ways. Which brings me to his constellation. It's gotta be the Plague Doctor mask. Polchinella looks like a Plague Doctor. Plague Doctor masks are modeled after the beaks of birds. Polchinella's title is literally the rooster. And as I said earlier, Plague Doctors were public servants who treated anyone with the bubonic plague regardless of status, but oftentimes were ineffectual at treating their patients, did more harm than good, and sometimes even tried to charge fees for bullshit Curse. cures. Similarly, Polchinella is a public servant. He's kind to child's family. He may be trying to please everyone, but he may be duplicitous in his reasons for being all of the above and have his own agenda, especially if his storyline is going to be anything like Zhu Yi's. And speaking of Zhu Yi, this dude looks like a plague doctor too! When this quest came out, I was like, why the hell is he wearing this dumbass hat? But now I get it. He's supposed to look similar to Harbinger Polchinella and a plague doctor. The dude's main weapon of choice is poison too. So yeah, Harbinger Polchinella's constellations gotta be this. Maybe Polchinella truly cares about about his job as a mayor and his people, but has resorted to horrible means to keep his position. Maybe he wants sole control of Snezhnaya, and maybe he'll try to play us and his comrades in the same way Zhu Yi played everyone around him. But as Yelan said, Trying to have friends on both sides, it has a way of turning everyone against you. And then there were two. I think it's about time we talk about the man of the hour, the number one fatuist, the Dilf of the group, the jester. Piero. There's a lot to say about him. Where to begin? His Commedia dell'arte counterpart is usually the butt of the joke in the play. He is a sad clown who pines after Columbina, but never ends up with her because she leaves him for Arlecchino. But despite being constantly pranked and no one taking what he says seriously, he is trusting of those around him. He represents outcasts. He's lonely, an outsider looking in at a world that does not want him and one he can never be a part of, which is why some regarded him as a representation of those struggling to make it in the world. Harbinger Piero is just like his Commedia counterpart. He was treated like a fool because his superior thought he wasn't as smart as his peers, but because they didn't listen to him, their country was destroyed by the gods. And we can confirm this country was Conria because Piero's got the primo gem shaped eye, which as far as we know is a feature unique to Conrians. Also, he may trust his comrades, but like I said earlier, 
there is a good chance Arlequino is gonna betray him and possibly even get Columbina to join her. Now let's talk about Harbinger Piero's design. It's totally reminiscent of Kaya's, and also his mask reminds me a lot of Dane's lift, just because the colors are the same, but we'll talk about Dane in a second. We know that Piero wasn't the king of Conria and was more like an advisor, since he failed to gain the favor of the previous ruler, and Diluc's new event quest adds more support to this. If you look on top of the Knights of Favonius roof, you can find a secret message in a mysterious box that was presumably left by Kaya. It details some writings of his father and how the Alberic clan became regents of Conria after the previous King Irman's strength failed. And I take that to mean the guy may have either died or was close to death, something like that. Since the Alberic clan wasn't originally royal and Piero wasn't royal himself, and since Piero shares a lot of design elements with Kaya and Kaya is a part of the Alberic clan, then saying Piero is a part of the Alberic clan is a pretty fair assumption to make. Now, a lot of people think Piero is Kaya's dad, but I actually think he's Kaya's grandfather. And I have two reasons for this. And one of them is kind of ridiculous. So I'll start with the one that makes sense. Kaya's father says that Kaya is Conria's last hope, which would imply Kaya's father might be working towards the restoration of Conria. I mean, we pretty much got confirmation that the Alberic clan attempted to restore Conria at some point, but failed. Since the Abyss Order wants to revive Conria too, then Kaya's father might have been working with them. However, while it may seem like the Abyss Order and the Fatui have aligning goals, there is one glaring difference between them. The Abyss and its power are corrosive. It causes sickness and delirium in humans. It is toxic to the world and life itself, and it might be trying to consume the world, which is kind of what the Deathly Statuette implies, an item Abyss heralds, lectors, and shadowy husks just carry around with them. It says, see, my child, all that lies under the throne of heaven shall be destroyed by upheaval. The eternal peace of the pitch dark void shall embrace us all. What's under the throne of heaven is the world, and the pitch dark void is likely the abyss, which means the abyss order is being driven by the abyss itself to consume the world and drag it into the abyss, and that does not align with the Fatui's goals. Also, it's possible Piero sees Conria as a lost cause. All of their people are cursed and according to Dainsliff, there is no cure for the curse. So why would he want to restore Conria if there's really no point? So if he's not working towards the restoration of Conria, like Kaya's father might be, then I highly doubt Piero actually is Kaya's father. Now for my kind of ridiculous reason for why Piero might be Kaya's grandpappy. Kaya says his grandfather was a pirate that found a magic sword of unrivaled power that dropped from Celestia. Now I don't think Kaya's grandfather was actually a pirate, nor do I think his grandfather found an actual sword. Kaya is known to lace the truth within his lies, so, Consider this, pirates steal things, right? They steal treasure, they loot, they raid, they do whatever the f*** they want. Conria had knowledge that they shouldn't have had, and they used it to accomplish many things, including something that got them destroyed. So, in a sense, you could consider Conrians to be pirates who stole the treasure of the gods, which is knowledge that the gods possess or something to that effect. If pirate in this context is actually code for Conrian, then I'm convinced the magic sword Kaya's grandfather found was actually Dane's lift. There's another possibility the warrior Eamon Locker, who established the Eamon Locker clan in Mondstadt, could also be the sword, since it's suggested he went to Conria after leaving Mondstadt. But Dane's lift and Eamon Locker might actually be the same person for reasons I'm not getting into right now. So just ignore Eamon Locker. <clears throat> anyway, Dane's lift is named after a sword from a legend called the Saga of Hild. The contents of of this story aren't really important at the moment. All you need to know for now is the name Dainsliff comes from this story. Aside from that, we know Dainsliff was called the Twilight Sword when he served Conria's royal guard. So there's two connections to Dainsliff being a sword. Now remember Unreconciled Stars. I know this is an abrupt turn and this is about to be a crack ass theory, but just stick with me here. In the event, the constellation of Leonard, an ancient adventurer, fell from the sky, causing people to fall into a coma and dream of climbing Pylos Peak, which was Leonard's greatest ambition he never accomplished. The Fatui were the ones who caused the stars to fall, but it was never actually explained how they made this happen. That's where Piero, 
comes in. Piero was the one who sent Scaramouche to investigate the incident, and Scaramouche thought Piero did so intentionally so he could discover the truth of the stars and the fake sky. It's not a stretch to say Piero is truly the one who made the stars fall, and if he did, I think he may have used Dainsliff's power to accomplish this. Now there's a very good theory about the stars in the sky actually being Irminsul fruit by Ashikai, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description box below if you want more context. But in my opinion, it totally makes sense the stars in the sky would actually be Irminsul fruit. The stars contain memories and elemental energy. So do Irminsul trees through their roots, which make up the ley line network. So it makes sense that fruits that grow on the tree would also contain memories and elemental energy. Also, Irminsul fruits look a lot like the meteorites and unreconciled stars, and if the Irminsul tree is in fact a world tree, then its canopy should extend above and around Tavat, making up the fall sky, and its fruits should indeed be the stars. This is where Dainsliff comes in. Dainsliff's title is Bow Keeper, or Bow Picker for the Chinese version. We know he's got something to do with the ancient Irminsul tree since he's got dirt on every character. Not to mention he talks about time and fate a lot, and if he has access to the Irminsul tree, then all of that makes sense. But I wonder what else he might be able to do with his connection to the tree, aside from possibly accessing memories. If he's a branch keeper or picker, then is it possible he could pick fruit from the branches of the tree, or shake its branches and cause its fruits to fall? In other words, is it possible Dainsliff might have the power to make stars fall from the sky, and if he can do this, then is it possible Piero used him to make the stars fall in unreconciled stars? Is it possible he is Piero's sword, which might then make Piero Kaya's grandfather? Hmm. Well, this idea requires Piero and Dainsliff to work together, which might sound unlikely since their stances on the gods slightly differ. Piero's working with a god to take down other gods. Dainsliff doesn't like the gods at all, but doesn't want to take them down. However, as far as we know, Dainsliff isn't really working against the Fatui. That's D Luke's job. The Abyss Order is more Dainsliff's territory. And like I said earlier, the Fatui probably don't like the Abyss or the Abyss Order either. So who knows? Maybe Piero and Dainsliff Dainsliff could have similar abilities? I don't know. I mean, a lot of people thought Dainsliff would be Piero before this teaser dropped. Look, I know this is a crack theory, but it could be possible. Putting that aside, there is one plausible connection I can make between Dainsliff and Piero, but that involves Dainsliff's likely Honkai Impact counterpart, Otto Apocalypse. Otto was referred to as a fool, the biggest fool in the world, a bigoted clown who was selfish and single-mindedly obsessed with his desire to revive Colin. This gives him a direct parallel to the name Piero, which means clown, and Otto is extremely similar to the Commedia dell'arte Piero, in that he is melancholic, stern, and has his heart broken by the one he loves, who does not return his affections. Piero is often the butt of the joke, and in a sense, Otto is too, because at the end of the day, he still couldn't be with his true love, even after reaching his goal, even though it didn't matter to him, he just wanted her to live. Just like Otto couldn't prevent Colin's death, Harbinger Piero couldn't save his own country. Perhaps these three are similar in more ways than we realize, but we'll just have to wait and watch how their stories unfold. And regardless of what Piero's actual relation to Kaya and Dainsliff is, there's no question he's somehow related to both. Now we arrive at the final harbinger, Columbina. There's a reason I left her for last. She's actually the harbinger that interests me the most. It's not about how graceful and creepy she is, or how powerful she is, but it's more what she likely represents that I'm drawn to. In order to properly explain. Let's first talk about her design and then discuss what we know about her, which isn't much at all, but that's fine. First, her constellation is definitely the crying dove because Columbina means little dove. She's actually similar to her Commedia counterpart in a lot of ways. Commedia Columbina is arguably the sanest character in the play, though she does show some madness in her pursuit of Arlecchino. She often changes clothes, makeup, and her accent to trick and seduce him. Maybe we'll see Harbinger 
Columbina screwing with Harbinger Arlecchino in a similar way, I don't know. Commedia Columbina is also graceful and intelligent, always having something smart to say to or about someone, which explains why Harbinger Columbina is sarcastic and sassy. She makes a really shady comment towards Dottore at the end of the teaser, saying, You're looking very young today, Doctor. Homosexual. Which he did not take as a compliment, and she knew he wouldn't. I get the idea she knows how to push people's buttons, and while appearing innocent, she just gives me the impression that she'd smile softly while carving your face off with a knife. She just oozes creepy vibes, and the weirdly disturbing singing and smiling just catapults those vibes tenfold for me. She might not be crazy per se, but she is definitely dangerous. She's ranked as the third Harbinger, and even Child doesn't know why she is, but he knows she's extremely dangerous. And if I had to guess why she is, my first thought is that she isn't human, at least not completely, which could account for her creepy vibes. And I think Dottore may have created or augmented her. She might be a prosthesis. Columbina and Dottore speak to each other with a certain level of familiarity that might imply a deeper relationship between the two. And it just so happens Commedia Dottore is usually the father of one of the Inamorati, otherwise known as the Lovers. While Columbina is usually a servant of the female lover and helps the lovers unite, she can sometimes be one of the lovers herself. And when she is, Dottore is usually her father. So I can totally see Harbingers Dottore and Columbina having a similar relationship, perhaps one that's between a creator and his creation, and in a sense, a father and his artificial daughter. Think Dr. Finkelstein and Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas. As for who Columbina might be a prosthesis of, maybe it's of someone Piero knows. As I said earlier, I think Piero and Otto Apocalypse might share a lot of similarities, and for those unaware, Otto made a whole bunch of clones of Colin in an attempt to revive her. Piero definitely isn't the mad scientist type, but Dottore is, and he is definitely similar to Otto in a lot of ways. Both engage in human experimentation, they both have clones of themselves, and they both share a lot of personality traits too. Hell, you can't spell Dottore without Otto, so maybe Piero asked Dottore to create Columbina for some purpose. Or maybe it was Pantalone who asked Dottore. Commedia Pantalone, like Commedia Dottore, is a father of one of the lovers, and I couldn't help but notice Harbinger Pantalone and Harbinger Columbina kind of look similar though that's mostly because they both have black hair, but whatever. While Columbina often rejects the advances of Pantalone in the Commedia, in a lot of the English versions of the play, Pantalone is actually Columbina's father. I wouldn't be surprised if Hoyoverse had all three of these Harbingers somehow linked to each other. Maybe Columbina was made in the image of Pantalone's deceased daughter or something. I don't f***ing know. The point is, I don't think Columbina is entirely human, but... Who knows? There is one thing I'm very convinced of though, and this is where the brain rot I warned you about at the beginning of the video comes in. I think Piero, Columbina, and Arlecchino are likely being used to represent the story of the first Seelie and the Traveler from afar. I know this might seem completely out of left field, but I promise you this makes a ton of sense. You know I love a good love story, and I'm obsessed with the love story between the first Seelie and the Traveler from Afar. The two were married in the Lunar Palace in the presence of the Moon Sisters Aria, Sonnet, and Canon. But 30 days following their union, they were cursed and robbed of their memories. I actually believe the first Seelie is one of the Moon Sisters, because there's a lot of strange overlap between the four, and I have several more reasons that I'm not getting into at the moment. You can check this video out where I do explain my reasoning a little bit, but I'll also be discussing the sisters a lot more in the near future. Now in this same video, I also talk about her lover, the traveler from afar, and how I think he's actually Fanny's. This is because there's a lot of similarities between Fanny's and the travelers themselves, in that each of them are associated with light, life, and also time. Fanny's means light bringer, and so does Lucifer. And in this video, I talked about the Travelers being reflective of Lucifer. The similarities between the Travelers and Fanny's are something we are definitely going to talk about in the future. Also, I should clarify that I don't think Fanny's and the Primordial One are the same character at all. All. This is because the Enconomians seemed unsure of the Primordial One's name, among other things. Something to discuss in future videos. I'm only mentioning this because a lot of people seem to believe the two are the same person. I do not. 
So for the sake of this video, consider them as two different characters. Now, in this video, I offered two choices for the identity of the first Seelie's lover, Dainsliff and Venti, because there are really, really good arguments, especially for Venti, that can be made for each of them having the following, a romantic interest, connections to the Moon Sisters, connections to Celestia, and also connections to Fanies. I even directly called Dainsliff Fanies, but again, Venti is a strong contender and perhaps an even better fit for the role than Dainsliff is. Again, refer to part 1.5 of Sun and Moon for a little more context. What's important to understand right now is that I believe these three specifically are part of a love triangle. But how do Dainsliff the first, Seelie, and Venti relate to these stock characters and their harbinger counterparts? Before anyone says it, because I feel like someone's gonna say this, I don't think Columbina is actually the first Seelie, and Piero's obviously not Dainsliff, and Arlecchino's obviously not Venti. What I think Hoyoverse is going to do is use Piero, Columbina, and Arlecchino's storylines as a frame story of the story of the first Seelie and the Traveler from Afar, similar to how the Sun Children of Enconomia mirrored the stories of the Seven Archons and Vision Wielders, but obviously weren't either of those things themselves. There were seven Sun Children, like there are seven Archons. Each of them had similar personalities and ambitions to the Archons. The Sun Children had to partake in the Rite of Solar Return and ascend to the top of the Dainichi Mikoshi to be incinerated by it, their souls trapped inside, much like vision wielders ascend to Celestia and also might be imprisoned there forever, you get the gist. I'm thinking Hoyoverse is gonna go in a similar direction with these guys, and I'll be extremely surprised if they don't because, well, get comfortable and get your brain juices flowing. I'm gonna need your undivided attention. Let's start by comparing Columbina and the first Seelie. Columbina is the one singing in the background during a winter night's lotso. Normally that wouldn't be anything to point out, but in this case, it's extremely important. The Moon Sisters are called the Daughters of Prose and Song, and their names are based on musical and poetic pieces. They're also called the Last Singers, and the first Seelie in particular is depicted as singing in a drunkard's tale. It's also mighty convenient that Columbina Columbina is ranked as the third harbinger. The number three is the number of the Moon Sisters. Columbina's name literally means Little Dove, and I linked the Moon Sisters in this video to doves through the god of time, Istaroth, who I also believe is a Moon Sister. I called the sisters the doves who held the branches of the Earmensal tree. Again, go watch that video for more context. The fact that Columbina has ties to music, doves, the number three, and is based on a character that's embroiled in a love triangle is just way too coincidental. Okay, what about Piero? I already compared him to both Dainsliff and his Honkai Impact counterpart, Otto, earlier, and their connections to the Commedia Piero, so I don't think I need to explain this one much, but I will say Colin looks a lot like a certain emergency food who might be one of the Moon Sisters and also connected to the first Seelie. And remember, Dainsliff wants to rescue some girl. That is one of his goals, and I find it very interesting that Columbina's code name is the Damselette. Or if you look at the Chinese version, the Maiden. Damsels and maidens are always featured in fairy tales concerning knights or princes who have to rescue a princess, the damsel or maiden, from some sort of danger, hence the saying, damsel in distress. Now, Piero doesn't say he's trying to rescue anyone, especially a girl, but like I said earlier, he did try to rescue Conria from imminent destruction and failed, just like Otto tried and failed to save Conria from her imminent death. Also, it's possible that what Piero might try to save Columbina from is Arlecchino. I don't know. We'll just have to see what happens and how it happens. But I am fully convinced these three characters mirror each other. That leaves Venti and Arlecchino. This one seems really random, right? Because at first, it doesn't look like they're very similar at all. However, when you look a little deeper, the two are a lot more comparable than you might think, especially when you compare Venti to the Commedia Arlecchino. First of all, Harbinger Arlecchino's codename is the Knave. Knaves are regarded as deceitful scoundrels, which is appropriate for Arlecchino given that there are massive red flags she'll probably betray the Fatui in some way. This makes her very similar to her Commedia counterpart, who 
actively thwarts the plans of his master. He is witty, resourceful, and cunning, at times feigning ignorance to appear dull and dim-witted while secretly being an intelligent trickster. His desire for Columbina is only trumped by his love of food and fear of his master. Venti is just like this in that he is very witty and cunning, is a prankster, acts a lot weaker and less capable than he actually is, and he's probably working to sabotage his boss, Celestia. There are a ton of indicators for this too, being his apparent disdain for Celestia and his apparent disdain to actually do his job as an Archon. His very ideal is freedom, which seems to be at odds with Celestia's oppressive approach to restricting humanity. And he's not outwardly going against Celestia possibly because he can't, whether out of fear or a lack of power. And instead of having an addiction to food, Venti's addicted to alcohol. Now, knave is also an archaic term used to refer to young boys, especially servant boys in service to a royal household. I don't know if you've noticed, but Venti has extremely boyish and androgynous looks, not to mention you could consider him a servant because he is an archon in service to Celestia, which could be likened to a royal household. This could be more support for Arlecchino ranking either 7th or 10th, since servants are amongst the lowest ranks in a royal household, not to mention Venti is said to be the weakest of the seven Archons, meaning he ranks 7th amongst his peers. Though again, he's likely a lot more powerful than he seems. Maybe Arlecchino is the same way, especially if she might be planning a coup. Commedia Arlecchino is also extremely nimble and acrobatic, and hey, would you look at that, so is Venti. His element is Animo, which offers a high range of mobility for many of its users. Commedia Arlecchino also takes little or no involvement in the advancement of the plot, as he's mostly there for comic relief and to maintain the flow of the performance itself. I would argue Venti is similar to this as he often takes a very passive role in the story of Genshin Impact, mostly providing comic relief, but also subtle direction by showing up and dropping information or a helpful hint someone conveniently needs at the right moment. He's been doing that a lot as of late, by the way. Finally, Harbinger Arlecchino runs the House of the Hearth Orphanage, and Venti is similar to her in that he's picked up some strays of his own to take care of, like Devalin, who had no parents of his own, or a home. It was Venti who gave him sanctuary. The Nessus tribe could also be collectively likened to orphans because they were exiled from Notlan and therefore had no home, and although they were enslaved in Mondstadt by the Lawrence clan, it was Venti who helped free them and provided them with a safe and permanent home. Guess you could even consider Kaya, Albedo, and Klee, not necessarily as orphans, but as people who were left behind by their parents in Mondstadt and didn't really have homes before that. And in the case of Kaya and Albedo, Venti's partially to blame for why they didn't have a home, just like Arlecchino is partially to blame for the Fatui causing situations that create orphans. Maybe Arlecchino's story will follow a similar pattern to the story of Venti and Vanessa's tribe. In this case, Arlecchino might be like Venti, and Vanessa's tribe might be like her orphans in the House of the Hearth, and the Lawrence clan could be the Fatui. And you know what? Venti was compared to a hearth in the Northern Stone Hearth furnishing item. It reads, the Animo Archon's protection has ensured that such hearths are no longer needed for the people of Mondstadt to outlast the winter. This is referring to the time when Andreas's blizzards covered the land and Venti banished all the ice and snow. He became like a hearth that brought warmth to the people of Mondstadt. Just like Arlecchino provides refuge for her orphans in the cold of Snezhnaya, maybe she too will blow the snow away and free her family. These two might be far more similar than you might think. Okay, if Columbina represents the first Seely, Piero represents Dainsliff, Arlecchino represents Venti, and the Commedia Columbina and Arlecchino are the ones in love, then I'd say Arlecchino best represents the role of the Traveler from afar in this frame story, which would imply Venti is the Traveler from afar. Since I think the Traveler from afar is also Thanes, <laughs> that would make Venti Thanes not Dainsliff, like I said in this video. And again, there are many plausible arguments to support this, but I'm not going into that conversation right now. Just follow my brain rot for a second, okay? My point is, if Venti is Fainis and Harbinger Arlecchino is meant to mirror Venti, then I think the nails being Arlecchino's constellation makes even more sense. In fact, 
It's perfect. I never thought I'd go back to Sunday Whoa! school, but here we go, and y'all are coming with me. It's time to talk about Jesus. Nails are often associated with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This constellation may just be one big reference to the holy nails, the nails that were used in Jesus' crucifixion, of which there were either three or four. It really depends on who you ask. Along with Jesus' crown of thorns, these nails refer to the passion of Jesus. The passion is not just Jesus' suffering and death upon the cross, it's really the story that leads up to his crucifixion, all the way to his resurrection. The passion encapsulates Jesus' suffering through all of these events, and again, the nails represent his crucifixion. Why is any of this important for Genshin? Well, Genshin takes a lot of inspiration from the Abrahamic faiths, but aren't Fanies and Jesus kind of similar? Genshin Fanies is a part of a quintet of gods that are really just emanations of one being, similar to how Jesus is a part of the divine trinity, being the sun aspect of one god. On that note, if Fanies truly is meant to reflect Jesus in some way, then maybe Fanies is a sun too, or in other words, one of the shining shades, and not the father, or in other words, the primordial one. Speaking of of the primordial one and their shining shades. This may seem random, but I'm sure you guys have heard the very popular theory about the artifacts representing them. Well, you know the circlet of Logos? Logos is something that's roughly translated to mean logic or reasoning. And that's how the word is used today, but that isn't a perfect translation. The Greek word originally referred to the content of a speech and its structure, though even the Greeks used this word in different ways. Given that the Chinese name for the circlet of Logos is the crown of reason, it kind of makes you wonder why a lot of the localizations of the game, typically Western ones, use Logos instead of just reason. I mean, it would be a little more accurate to the source material right? Well, in Christianity, the Logos is a title for Jesus Christ. This is because Jesus is called the Word of God and thus embodies the divine Logos. I can't help but wonder if Logos was intentionally used to refer to Jesus and ultimately be an indirect reference to Phanes. But even if it wasn't, the most important similarity between Jesus and Phanes is their major theme of death and resurrection. If Arlecchino truly mirrors Venti, who might be the traveler from afar and Fanny's, I will not be surprised if these nails are indeed Arlecchino's constellation, nor will I be if her rank is number seven. I rest my case for now. Alrighty, here is my final lineup for the Harbingers ranks and constellations. Rank 11 is Tartalia with the Monoceros Kai Kai the Whale Constellation. Rank 10 is Sandrone with the Marionette. Rank 9 is Pantalone with the Spiral Hand. Rank 8 is Another One Bites the Dust with the Moth. Rank 7 is Arlecchino with the Three Nails. Rank 6 is Scaramouche with the Doll Holding a Heart. Rank 5 is Pulcinella with the Plague Doctor's Mask. Rank 4 is Dottore with the Symbol for Heresy. Rank 3 is Columbina with the Crying Dove. Rank 2 is Capitano with the Hand of Glory. And Rank 1 is Piero with the Crying clown mask. I was gonna rant about chess, but bitch, I'm tired. My brain is mush, and I'm sure your brains are mush too. So I'm gonna end it here. This teaser was so perfect, and I want more. I wanna play all the Harbingers. I just, I want them all. They're so cool. Even if you kill them all off, mihoyo, let us play them, please. And I cannot wait for Sumeru to drop. But what are your thoughts on this teaser? And on Sumeru, I guess. And what does your Harbinger list look like? Why don't you show me? All right, I'm gonna go play in the Golden Apple Archipelago for a bit. I'm pretty sure Mona and Fischl have been waiting at the gates for like two weeks. Thank you for for watching if you made it this far like seriously damn kudos to you i appreciate you and i'll see you guys on the other side of the moon